We'll start the final talk of uh, today, the, the third day of the workshop. And uh, Yang will be giving us a talk on a voyage to non-ADS holography. Okay, let me thank the organizers for this wonderful workshop and the uh, special mission for inviting me. And also thanks Shinji for joining us to <laughs> National Group Park twice. Uh, this is a very, very exciting experience. So today I'm going to talk about non-ADS holography. This uh, project was initiated uh, back in 2005 with my PhD advisor Simon. And then later we have uh, two follow-up other works uh, with Yeller and Niels and later Durban in Amsterdam University joined our, our project. Um, so let me explain the plan of the talk. Uh, I will first uh, talk about my motivations, why I need to consider non ADS holography. Uh, because holography is the most powerful tool to study quantum effects of gravity, and uh, then we should ask the question, how general the idea of holography can be? Uh, does, it, does it depend on relativity? Is that uh, possible to construct the holographic model, not ADS CFT, but something else? And uh, another motivation was some puzzles in the Lipschitz and Chen Simon's uh, higher spin theory. Uh, the puzzle was in Chen Simon's high spin theory, let's take the high spin theory um, in 3D and describe the Chen Simon theory taking values in as two copies of the SL3R algebra. And uh, you can write down Lipschitz gauge uh, fields as the solution to Flamin's equation. But you, after you calculate the metric line fields, you found that the only metric line fields non trivial is the Lipschitz space time which means uh, you have a vacuum solution to Einstein equation, which is literally space-time back, but we know that's not true. So this puzzle gives a challenge, uh, it's challenging the equivalence between Chen-Simon theory of uh, the higher spin version and the Einstein theory of action plus higher spin corrections. And I will explain uh, resolve this puzzle in, in Chen-Simon theory, uh, high spin theory first, and then I, it, it's, uh, I will provide more examples about uh, uh, the newton type cartan chen simon theory, and uh, especially in this twist, this portion of newton cartan chen simon theory, we find the Lipschitz solutions again, and uh, that would be the correct action uh, to explain the Lipschitz holography. So we know holography, um, to, to talk about the uh, two theories uh, are e equivalent or correspond to each other in a holographic perspective, we usually, uh, first we, we will check the, the symmetry on both sides theory should match. So for example, in the case of ADS CFT correspondence, the isometry of the ADS is exactly the conformal, global conformal symmetry of the CFT. So for d equals to 2 case, uh, the structure of SO2 comma 2 is two copies of SL2R, gives us the exact Chen Simon's, two copies of a Chen Simon's description of the gravity. So this is what we know as ADS 362 duality. And to generalize this duality, and we can consider how to generalize this SL2R symmetry group. So there are three parts we can generalize. One is SL. Second part is the two, three part, the third part is the R. Um, if I generalize this two to any integer n, that would be the highest spin generalization. And if I take special limit uh, for some non-relativistic of some uh, parameter inside this SL2R, I will change the name as L. Uh, later you will see today uh, in my talk, it will become the 2D Poincaré essential extended algebra. And if you generalize this R to other, uh, for example, periodic number field, that will be periodic ADS CFT. The reason uh, we are considering this non relativistic holography can be seen from this famous Brown Stein cube. Um, the three axes are uh, this is uh, H bar, tells us the quantum effects. 
This G is the gravitational effects, uh, it's the new, new, Newton gravitational constants, and uh, this axis is 1 over C. So at C is infinity H bar is 0, G is 0, this is a classical mechanics, F equals to MA, the theory we studied since uh, middle school. And uh, to turn on any constants, we will give the uh, the corresponding theory we have already studied. For example, if I turn on this one over C from zero to a finite number, that would be special relativity. And the finite H bar gives us quantum mechanics. Um, the general relativity is a union of gravitational effects and the special relativity effects. And the uh, quantum field theory is ex ex effects of quantum effects and the special relativity. And these two theories have already passed many experimental tests in uh, extraordinary accuracy. So they are, they are the best theory we have until now. And our final goal, or the dream of every scientist, is to find a theory of quantum gravity, which in this corner we still don't know what it is. But you see from this cube, we, uh, there are very little attention is paid uh, to this corner, which is uh, Galilean quantum gravity. It's a union of quantum effects and the gravitational effects. So, even from a phenomenological perspective, there might, uh, it might be interesting to explore this corner further so that we want to know whether there are any experiments can be used to test any uh, this theory further. Or it might be uh, provide a simpler version of a holography, a simpler version of a quantum graph. And then let me explain. I think, the, the, I think the problem with that reasoning is that if you go back, the, the, the base of that cube that you claim that we, we, we solved and understood is not very well solved or understood. Maybe perturbative theory, whatever. So, so, so even even a quantum field theory, yeah. very very fast uh, becomes uh, complicated, and you don't know much about non-perturbative quantum field theory. Yeah. And to go up that side, you sort of need to have solved that problem, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> so the, let me explain the puzzles in Lipschitz's uh, Lipschitz's Einstein theory. This is my initial motivation for this project. So Lipschitz symmetry is describing the anisotropic scaling in time and space directions. And T is scales with the number of the power Z, as it scales normally. And this appears not, uh, uh, appear normally in the strongly coupled condensed matter systems. So if I want to study strongly coupled condensed matter physics, uh, I like the mathematical tool, but holography may provide a tool, then I need to construct the holographic duality geometry, um, which has this part of a symmetry. So these kind of uh, space-time are called Lipschitz geometries, discovered uh, uh, by Shami Tatu and Xiao Liu and uh, Mulligan. And these geometries look like this, and that is dynamical exponent. And uh, there are another type of the geometry with the Lipschitz scaling, but with possibly further uh, special conformal transformation, extended symmetry is called shredding the space time. And uh, the special conformal transformation only appears at special value of z equals to 2. And then that is uh, ex exactly the value we are interested in today. Chen Simon's uh, high spin Lipschitz theory was uh, first studied in this paper in 2012. What they did was to start from a uh, gauge theory, Chen Simon's gauge theory, taking value in SL3R, and the W2 is the generator uh, with weight 2. And you can write down A and A bar respectively, and by just doing a similar thing in Einstein gravity, you define the vial line and the, you, you can write down what is the metric, the spin free field, and then you can calculate the metric is of this form exactly in Lipschitz, and the spin free field is of this form. And E is defined in this way. 
And more general Lipschitz space-time can be also defined in this manner. So if you ask the gauge field taking values in the SLN are algebra, and uh, you take the highest uh, weight uh, generator to be W plus, and the, 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 the weight is Z, because W plus always commute with L1, because uh, according to this algorithm, W plus is roughly some power of L1, and then you, you can write down similar gauge solutions, and it gives you the Lipschitz metric with Z is equals to N minus 1. Um, there is an interesting work in 2004 done by Daniel Grumiller and uh, his postdoctor and students and uh, Sujo Ray. The author just explored the asymptotic symmetry of, <coughs> of this Lipschitz space time and asked the, what is the possible, uh, uh, possibly the largest uh, asymptotic asymptotic symmetry they have, they find that the asymptotic symmetry is nothing but the two copies of a W3 algebra. But the, what we recall in the, in, the, in the past was asymptotically two copies of W3 algebra is given by uh, the bulk should be ABS, and then you add a brown hanau conditions, uh, generalized high-spin brown hanau condition, you can get the two copies of a W3. But why you start from Z equals 2 Lipschitz? Which, is the, which has a very small subset of isometry, you can get the same symmetry algebra. And uh, another confusion in their paper is, if you take a look at these spin three matter fields, you take uh, all of these KP securities constants to be one. These constants to be one. You will have a Lipschitz space time, and spin three fields is turned off, so which means, from Einstein's gravity point of view, you are having a Lipschitz space-time and no matter to support it. This is not true because Lipschitz space-time is not the vacuum solution of Einstein equation. For example, the work by Shamin Katru was uh, Lipschitz space-time should be supported by at least a massive gauge field. So the puzzle was, how can you have Lipschitz space-time without matter to support it? The resolution is the, the geometry of Lipschitz. Lipschitz geometry is not trustworthy or physically is not meaningful. You cannot have extra fields in this transcendent theory. The reason is for these vial binds, you, uh, mu it has, three, uh, has three directions and A is the Lorentz indices, so together they have 24 degrees of freedom. But and in metric-like fields, there are six components in metric and the ten components in the spin three fields, but together they have a 16. So at least from gauge theory to the metric-like theory description is 16 to 16 map. So for this map to work, you have to require some non-degeneracy conditions. For example, if you are solving a linear algebraic problem uh, of 16 variables, then you are expecting a determinant of a 16 by 16 matrix is uh, non-zero. This is a similar problem here. And the, the problem is from a uh, first order frame uh, description of gravity to the second order Einstein description of gravity, you need to impose this uh, torsion-free condition so that you can solve a spin, spin connection uniquely from the given value by. Then you can trust that your geometric, uh, geometric descriptions. So given such a value by determined by a minus a bar over two, and the spin connection given by a plus a bar is always a solution as long as the blindness condition are solved. But the question is, is the omega equals to one a half of a plus a bar the only solution to this equation? The answer is not for Lipschitz. If you give it, you gave it such a Lipschitz space time, you will see the most general spin connection is uh, the standard a half a plus a bar plus something else. And the lambda one and the lambda two are very general parameters. You you don't need uh, for any real number. Uh, this is always a solution. So. The conclusion for the, the lesson we learned from this part 
is the addiction solution in SL3 Archon Simon's theory is the pathologically defined because of this degeneracy. But this also raises another question. After all, this uh, gauge solution is a solution to Chen Simon's blindness equation. So the question is can you build up a Chen Simon's action whose uh, equation motion has this as the solution? And uh, this part could in have a different space time interpretation as a, uh, as a classical solution. So, if this, this works, then we possibly build, build up the holographic for Lipschitz space time. And to do this, we search the possibility in Newton Cartan gravity. The reason we do that is, first of all, we know for sure Lipschitz gravity has a vacuum solution as Lipschitz space time, and we don't need any matter to support it. And the second possibility is more uh, uh, fundamental. I, because what the Shamika Chu did was to use a massive gauge field to support the Lipschitz space time in Einstein gravity. This is like embedding a non relativistic gravity into a relativistic gravity. So, but uh, why not just start from non relativistic symmetry group and build, a, build up a gravity on it? and then check whether we can build up a, 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 a parallel non-relativistic gravity theory. And also, in a later work by, uh, uh, by Hunt, Yella and Niels, they showed that the dynamical version of the newton cartan gravity is exactly equivalent to the sharp issues gravity. So our uh, work start, becomes can we find a Chen Simon's word version of a Newton Cartan gravity so that possibly the beach space time is the solution? And the Newton Cartan gravity, uh, usually the metric can be degenerated, so in principle, possibly we don't need to worry about the, the degeneracy problem appears in the uh, uh, Riemannian metric. And in this case, the Newton Cartan gravity is described by one bio binds, one form, and the inverse metric, and some gauge field. And the inverse metric, spatial metric, is the rank D minus 1, and the tau is rank 1. So together they form a rank D, a non degenerate uh, Rowenzi metric, but they, respectively, they are degenerate uh, fields. And you can also show by metric like description, this d tau is proportional to this uh, anti-symmetric part of affine connection. So this part is, describe, is describing the torsion. Actually, torsion is very natural in Newton Cartan gravity. This is not something you can pick freely, and but actually fixed by formalism. And uh, the based on this feature of torsion, Newton Cartan gravity can be classified into three types. And all, all of them discovered from the uh, classical analysis of Lipschitz holography. The first type is torsionless Newton Cartan gravity, which means the d tau equals zero. This corresponds to pro projectable for sharp Lipschitz gravity. The physical meaning of this is from Newtonian perspective, that means that in this whole space time there exists the absolute time coordinates. And the uh, second type, it's called the twist distortion of Newton Cartan gravity. So tau is uh, constrained to satisfy this equation. You can see this equation is equivalent to the exist field B such that e tau minus some constant z uh, B vag tau equals zero. From symmetry perspective, this might be means there exists the dilatation uh, scaling generator such that this is satisfied. H is the uh, generator of the time direction. Uh, what does this mean? Uh, this means uh, tau is higher surface of the octagon, which means that there exists a foliation of equal time spatial surface described the Riemannian geometry. And the last case is there's no constraints on tau. Uh, in Newton Cartan gravity, you prefer tau is not constrained. The reason is uh, from the 
holographic point of view, you might want to uh, calculate the energy momentum tensor by varying these uh, wire by fields. And uh, the, the less tau is constrained, the more information you can extract from this calculation. Uh, for example, in torsional Newton Cartan gravity, what you can calculate from this variation is you can calculate the energy flux, you can calculate energy momentum tensor. But in this twisted torsional Newton Cartan gravity case, you cannot do, uh, you cannot calculate all the information. You can at most calculate the energy density and the divergence of energy flux. So there are some information you cannot find from this calculation if your uh, torsion gets more constrained. So to study this Newton Cartan gravity, and especially in transcendent theory, we need to explore all the possibility of non-relativistic symmetries. So these symmetries, what we are interested in, includes the first type is Galilean algebra, which contains H is the time translation, G is the Galilean boost, P is the spatial translation and the rotation. I'm giving an example in 3D. And you can add a central extension and to this algebra, and then the whole algebra will call the Bachmann algebra. And the list here, uh, uh, the A it runs from 1 to 2, it's just uh, because we are in 3D. And you can also add a cosmological constant, the algebra is called the Newton Hooke algebra. And uh, these two algebra are usually considered as a uh, speed of light goes to infinity limit of the <coughs> L, uh, relativistic conformal algebra. And there's another limit, is C equals to zero limit, called ultra-relativistic limit, is the Karolian algebra. Uh, but uh, this is not the topic that we are interested in today, so I didn't write it down. And I can have a Schrodinger algebra by adding the dilatation generator D to the Galilean algebra uh, here. And then the whole algebra will look like this, and with the Galilean parts, at z equals 2, there is a special conformal transformation uh, you can add it to this whole algebra and uh, hdk will form as L2R sub-algebra and the pk will be the boosts. And there's another Galilean conformal algebra which we are interested in, uh, discovered by Kupakuma and Ajumbagi in, in this paper. And uh, maybe possibly some, someone else are interested in the BMS algebra uh, due to the identification between BMS3 and the Galilean, uh, Galilean conformal algebra in two dimensions. Let me first review how to construct uh, Einstein gravity from these symmetry algebras. For example, in general dimensions, you can have a Poincaré algebra look like this. Uh, by gauging it, what we mean is we take a gauge field, taking values in this algebra, which transform under the gauge transformation like uh, in, in the usual sense. And the lambda is the gauge transformation takes the value in it. What we want to do is I want to identify this CA as the diffeomorphism and this sigma AB as the local Lorentz transformations. So I call this to be internal gauge transformation, this part to be the translation. So we can, from this equation, we can solve that the variation of the wire bind is of this form. But on the other hand, we also know that the derivative of the wire bind can be calculated like this. And to identify the derivative with the gauge transformation, so so that this diffeomorphism is, identi is identified with this gauge transformation in this way, we find to compare these two equations, we have to set the RP equals zero. RP equals zero is equivalent to the torsion-free condition we impose, the DE plus E right omega equals zero, that equation. And uh, th this equation is telling us two things. One is you need, you can map the diffeomorphism to your local translation uh, and the internal gauge transformation to your lo Lorentz trans local Lorentz transformation. 
And the second thing is you can solve the spin connection from the wire line so that your metric description is physically meaningful. That, that constraint is not gauge invariant. Sorry? That constraint is not gauge invariant. This one? Uh, no. no. Seems like a very bad thing to do. Uh, you grab the theory that has a gauge symmetry and they will impose a constraint that's not gauge invariant. So, for that to work, it also has to be true that the curvature, or what do you, how do you call them, uh, M's, for the M's is also, is also zero. So it means that only on shell, if you have a dynamical theory of gravity, mm -hmm. only on shell can you do this and think of it this way. But it's just a, it's just a classical statement at the end for a theory of dynamical gravity. For example, you, it's not clear that you can do geometry this way. Because in geometry, the gravity is not dynamical. You could, in principle, consider manifold with all sorts of different things of all, all kinds of curvature. And imposing uh, that something has no curvature, mm -hmm. it's not, uh, sorry, no torsion, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not gauge invariant, right? Because the torsion is only a tensor and the Lorentz transformation, but not under the translation. Yeah. Um. I just made some statements. I'm just yeah, saying that yeah. it's a bit of a, it's a dangerous thing to, to identify these two things off shell. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, I, I agree. But uh, in principle, what you can do is, uh, after you impose these constraints, um, you, you solve the spin connection, and then you try to ask the question, what kind of gauge invariant uh, metric-like fields I can write down, and I collect them, and write down the action in the chart. Well, the thing is that, that that equation is not always true. If you change the gauge, that yeah, equation yeah. changes. Yeah, yeah. And okay, so what we can do to Newton cartography by gauging a Bachmann algebra? So what we usually do is okay. I also take a gauge field, taking values in the algebra, and uh, for each algebra generators, I assign to a, a gauge field. I call it. This is the time like. Uh, while buying this is the space parts and the spin connections and uh, a possible U1 gauge field. So I, I can also again write down this uh, uh, field stress tensor. Um, what er uh, Eric Schreff and uh, his collaborator did in 2010 was I can similarly impose the portion, similar torsion free condition Rh and Rp. Uh, equals to zero, so that I want to solve the spin connection you need from while by, but they fail, uh, and the resolution, uh, because this is uh, uh, still to infinity limit, it is sometimes uh, something that goes wrong because your metric becomes a degenerate, uh, the resolution they provide is, if I add this U1 gauge field, I can solve the spin connection from the while binds, and uh, together, with the least gauge field. And so I imposed these three conditions so that I can guarantee my metric like description is basically meaningful. And to check that, uh, you can indeed map the local diffeomorphism to the gauge transformation by requiring this gauge uh, curvature, uh, this curvature tensors to vanish. And, and your diffeomorphism is identified that is with these gauge transformations. But, and your local Lorentz transformation is changed because this is the number of divisive limit, it becomes the local Galilei transformations. And the invariant under local Galilei transformations are time like while binds and the inverse metric. And uh, if you write the H mu nu uh, with lower indices, that will not be gauge invariant. So uh, you, you cannot use that. But in principle, you can always write down Lorentz metric to be of this form, although this is not gauge invariant. To put everything into a transcendent theory, what we need uh, to do is to find out what's the meaning of the trace. In principle, this trace means that you trace over some uh, uh, representations of the algebra, these eight takes, 
And this is the non-degenerated bilinear product defined on this uh, the algebra and any both. For example, in the case of ISO 2,1, which is uh, 3D flat isometries, and the isometry, uh, the bilinear product you can calculate is this. And then you will find that this uh, transcendence action is equivalent to Einstein Gilbert action. But this is no longer true in Galilean or Bachmann algebra because they are not semi simple. So their Cartan Kitty metric is degenerate. You cannot just define a transcendent theory like in this way. What you have to do, uh, suggested by Witten and Nati, was you can solve this uh, invariant bilinear product equation. This equation means if there exists a bilinear product on this the algebra, I operate it with some uh, the algebra generators. This operation is invariant, so which means it is invariant under the algebra operation. And then you, they can see, give an example of how this works. The example is called the central extended Euclidean group, uh, usually denoted as E2C. It contains the rotation parts and the central part. And then they find that the bilinear product is of this form, so which means you can define non-degenerated bilinear product, and then you can write down the transcendent theory, or what's the mean the weekend theory. Now let's do the same thing for this uh, Bachmann algebra, and then you will find again that the, even by solving this equation, you cannot get a non-degenerate the sigma uh, sigma matrix. What you have to do uh, find by this. Uh, paper in 2009 is you need to add the extra generators so and these extra generators is central to the other generators and you can check very carefully the Jacobi identities will be restored and uh, this whole algebra called extended Bachmann algebra does allow a non-degenerated bilinear product on this the algebra uh, manifold and then you, you are ready to write down what is the transcendence action on, on this the extended Bachmann algebra. <laughs> and so let's take the gauge uh, field, taking values in this extended algebra, and I put everything into it, and I will write down this action in the biobind form. You, as you can see, the, the extra generator you added has a gauge field zeta corresponds to it, and then this zeta works as the Lagrangian multipliers to this equation, so it imposes a torsionless condition d tau equals zero. So this theory is should be equivalent to a torsionless Newton Cartan gravity. So to confirm that, let's write down the action in terms of a metric like fields. By some algebra, you, you can find the gauge, uh, this action in terms of gauge field is equivalent to the action of this form. This k mu are extrinsic curvatures just analogous to the standard uh, uh, decomposition of Einstein uh, gravity. And uh, there is a phi here called the Newton potential determined by this M, M1, U1 gauge field. And there is a spatial ridge scalar here. And the reason why this is portion, uh, no, we, we also say this is portion is because it is also related to projectable hashara lipschitz gravity. Recall the most uh, general form of hashara lipschitz gravity is of this form, and uh, there are two uh, kinetic terms invariant under local Galilean transformations, respectively. So there is a free prime the lambda you can add in the action. Um, for every possible lambda, this action is invariant. So, but to compare these two, you find the lambda is one, so that it can be get equivalent to transcendent theory. So far, so good. But to, I want to make an analogy between the <coughs> transcendent. Uh, Newton Cartan gravity to transcendent Einstein gravity, I should add something like conformal symmetry or scale invariance. <coughs> the conformal 
generation of the Galilean symmetry is called the Schrodinger algebra. Especially for Z equals 2, we can have a special conformal transformations. And you want to play the same law or the same trick that I can add a special uh, central generator S so that I possibly can construct a non degenerated bilinear product on the Schrodinger algebra. But that's no longer true because it will violate a Jacobi identity. So to restore Jacobi identity, what we found in our paper was we should uh, introduce three, three, two more generators so that together there are tri they are triple extended Schrodinger algebra in 2D. And so this part, the red part are original Schrodinger algebra. The blue parts are the, uh, the extra generators we, ex uh, we introduced so that we can possibly get a non-degenerate bilinear product. And uh, to fix Jacobi identity, you find that you, you also need the list of uh, uh, commutators in black. So together they form a complete algebra. And you can check the non-degenerate bilinear product of this algebra. You can find there is indeed a non-trivial C1, which parametrize the non-degenerate non non matrix, but there are also other non-trivial uh, parameters which can, can, uh, can appear in the non-degenerate uh, bilinear product, but they, if you turn off C1, they self itself will be degenerate. So the main, main primary part of this action, transcendence action, is of this form, if you take the gauge field into a transcendence action, and again, the interesting part is because we are introducing the dilatation D and the dilatation T covers some gauge field B and from the classification we just talked about this might imply the Priestley's torsional newton cartan gravity so we are expecting some D tau equals to Z B wedge tau form from the action and it is exactly true the S generator which corresponds to this zeta gauge field exactly imposes the portion uh, twist this portional condition and the other alpha and the beta this gauge field also impose some condition uh, gauge uh, some multiplier condition some constraints which you can solve and uh, they itself will satisfy the um, uh, second beyond the identities and uh, these are exactly the constraints you can find from the old uh, knowledge of Lipschitz holography about this twist distortion of newton cartan graph <coughs> and the exciting part is we did find Z equals to 2 Lipschitz solution as a, uh, from this action sorry so C2 and C3 you're setting to 0? sorry C2 and C3. C2 and C3 is that to zero, they are not important. The reason is, uh, if you write down C2 and C3 here, and uh, you want to vary, write down what is the classical action, uh, equation motion, and then first you, you, you find, uh, sorry, let me find. So, for, for example, for C2 part, it will be uh, B wedge DB uh, minus 2 wedge B wedge F, something like this, maybe up to a sign. So, what's happening is, oh, sorry. So, what's happening is, you can see here, this Lagrange multiplies impose some constraints on P, and that is DB minus F, where tau is zero. So these are, can be derived by direct variating this C R by theta. So if you variate this D here, and you will find that this equation motion will be exactly the constraints here. So classically, it does not contribute anything. But if you calculate the partition function, then there might be some effects on it. The reason I'm asking is because when, when, when it happens that you have more than one structure, mm -hmm. sometimes you can tune the parameters 
such that you factorize out part of the group. So for example, take it as an example, take SO2,2, mm -hmm. the two possible structures, yeah. and tuning them mm -hmm. means that you just get only just, uh, just NSL2, and you can toss the other SO2. Yes. So, so this indicates, sometimes, that there's a commuting part of the algebra that you can separate. Yeah. And then you might want to, to keep, keep things minimally, to tune C3, C2, and C1, so you can decouple part of the algebra. Does this happen or not? Uh, it doesn't happen in this case, but it will happen in, in the other case. What other case? Uh, I, I'm going to show you in next oh. example. So, this, uh, to, to interpret this action, we need to write it in terms of a metric like fields. So, after some work, you can find this action, and you can see that the Hushabad is the, this company is still one in this case, and, it, and uh, there, there is an extra term, this RK, we don't know a, a better way of presenting it, so we just write it in terms of uh, uh, ADM decomposition, um, and this v mu, v mu here can be fixed to zero, gauge fixed into zero by choosing the special conformal gauge transformation appropriately. So this part is not very important. This part would be very special. And uh, this action is normal, uh, not normal, and uh, we never seen it before. <coughs> the, the main difference is if I want to construct the conformal Lipschitz gravity uh, with z equals to two. What will appear in usual construction is the lambda, the Hushabrik company lambda, is fixed it to be 1 over dimension d. And for d equals to 2, in our case, this should be a half. But, but in our case, that's the lambda equals to 1, so, so this is a normal action. And the second thing we are very interested in is this is the uh, Actually, we purely build up from, uh, from the transcendence gauge theory. But in the old knowledge about the Lipschitz holography and the twisted portion of Newton Cartan gravity was I have to introduce the extra Stuckelberg scalar so that I can leave the uh, symmetry generated by n and to a uh, Stuckelberg uh, symmetry, so that I can guarantee the local Galilean invariance and uh, this n transformation inver invariance simultaneously. And so the scalar must be there from the old knowledge of pers holographic perspective, but it's not the, in this sense. So we want to say this is might be the minimum construction of Lipschitz holography because we only need a very small sub subset of the input. Since the symmetry algebra we saw was very, uh, very neat, you might want to ask what is this algebra. To our surprise, to understand what this algebra is, I write the HDK, the SL2R part, into the Virasoro form, and the three uh, extended algebra as generator in the N, and the uh, spatial translation and the Galilean boost into the Y, I can found this uh, very large algebra. And this algebra turns out to be super BMS algebra or super Galilean conformal algebra uh, discovered by Arjun Puki and Gubat Kuma with some central extensions. Um, the BMS part is is exactly formed by this HDK SL2R part of a Schrodinger plus the central extension we add, the SYZ part. So this part it looks exactly the BMS part. And uh, you have and uh, this Y spatial translations and the Galilean boost lo looks like some super super charges because of this structure S square minus a quarter reminds you. And these rot spatial rotations works as uh, can be analogous to the R symmetry of this uh, superconformal algebra. We don't know why the superconformal algebra appears here, and you can see that J and the R charge itself <coughs> forms a fine algebra. 
but I will give you like, uh, some interpretation later. And the third example I want to talk about today is the uh, Newton Hook uh, gravity. Newton Hook gravity is the Galilean gravity plus cosmological constants. And uh, this is because uh, we study that because we want to make analogous to ADS. ADS is uh, Einstein gravity with cosmological constant, so we want to introduce cosmological constant. And uh, we call it pseudo because we make a complexification of it so that it can change time translation to some uh, dilatation and the rotation um, will also get an uh, extra uh, complex number here. Because we know ADS space-time, ADS3, has isometry SL2,2 as the two copies of SL2R, and each SL2R has the non-degenerate bilinear product, uh, so they can be uh, independent. It turns out that this extended pseudo-Newton hook can also can be written as two copies of algebra called the central extended Poincaré algebra which is the complexified version of the Euclid central extended 2D Euclidean algebra and uh, we can uh, not be used. So I, I write a P2C in terms of list form so that this L0 can work as uh, scaling transformations. So compare P2C and E2C, the difference is, is in E2C the the J is the rotation, but in P2C, the J is complexified and do linear uh, combination, you'll find it, this uh, rotation can become the scaling transformation. And uh, in this algebra, there are two parameters of non-degenerate bilinear product. And it, again, you can write down the transcendence action of it. There are four independent parts. The first part will be analogous to Einstein Gilbert action. The second part will be completely analogous to topological massive gravity term. And the third part and fourth part will uh, the role uh, of uh, the analogy will be seen later. And uh, to make the full analogy to Einstein Gilbert action, you might want to say, uh, let's start from Einstein Gilbert action in SO2, comma two plus two U1 extensions, which I call Q1 and Q2 are generators. Z1 and Z2 are corresponding gauge fields. I write down the full SO2 comma two uh, plus two U1 extension transcendence action, like, like this. And see, you, you can see this, this part is your familiar inside Gilbert action. This part is a uh, topological massive gravity term. The second line vanishes after you impose the total free conditions. And these two parts will be U1. And to make an analogy, what we did was I can write down the vial bonds in Einstein gravity, the E2 and the omega 2, in terms of vial bonds in Newton Hook gravity. And the parameter tries to by a uh, parameter alpha. And uh, I take this into the Einstein gravity, and then set alpha goes to infinity. I will recover that Newton hook action I obtained here. So this means that the Newton hook gravity can be exactly reducted from Einstein gravity. It is an, some kind of non relativistic limit of Einstein gravity. And the vacuum solution to this uh, Newton hook uh, action is the ADS space time in Newton cutoff frame. So, which means you have a how it should be rho is a radial direction and the spatial metric is of this. So you can write down the Lorentz metric and you can see that's exactly the ADS in global coordinates. At the end, it is the gauge field, which is set to zero in this vacuum solution. And from, from the algebra perspective, it's like I do some rescaling in uh, spatial translation and uh, spatial conformal transformation of the conformal algebra, and uh, there is the linear combination in the dilatation and the rotation. <coughs> Under the, this uh, identification, you stand alpha goes to infinity. You can find the Einstein Hilbert action. Uh, the gauge field is exactly the same as Newton Hook gauge field. 
To understand that, you can also from the each kind of copy of P2C by taking alpha go to infinity limit of this SL2R cross U1. It's just uh, um, so the dilatation will have a linear combination, and the alpha as alpha goes to infinity terms, this part and this part will get cancelled, and so you are left with the P2C algebra. So, but for any finite alpha, you can convince yourself this is just an, uh, this curly L and N are just another equivalent expression for this SL2 uh, U1 algebra. What you can do next is to ask what are the possible asymptotic symmetry of this transcendent theory. And uh, in SO2, 2 transcendents, asymptotic Vivar Soro symmetries uh, can be understood in terms of this uh, the Sokolov reduction of the boundary SL2 as a mean weaker model. So this reduction is to say I can impose a dirichlet constraint on the leading radial components of the metric. And uh, this constraint will induce, uh, you generate the gauge transformation by Poisson brackets. And what we need to do is to construct the currents which are invariant under this gauge transformation. And solving this uh, standard gauge transformation equation, you can find zero compo components of this lambda is determined in this form. But uh, this form is unsatisfying for any finite alpha because and the infinitesimal charge are not integrable. So what we did is to, okay, we do some algebra and you find that after this redefinition, the bar the generators will be integrable. Uh, I think I forgot a bar here. I think I forgot a bar here. And then you will find the boundary charges in this form will be and integrable, and these uh, integrable currents are determined are of this form, and which they will be invariant under the gauge transformation generated by the deregulated boundary condition. And you check the delta A equals to the delta A variation equation, you will find the delta T will vary like this. And this part reminds us the Vera sorrow. So we write them in terms of Fourier modes. They are exactly the Vera Soro. For any finite alpha, they are what the Vera Soro uh, find U1 uh, algebra. But, uh, and for any finite alpha, this term is non trivial. So you can redefine these Vera Soro generators. So you can remove the second line, you will get the Vera Soro with uh, U1 affine. But as alpha goes to infinity, you cannot do that. And, uh, this, term, this central term and this term cannot be removed, and you are left with a different warp Vera Soro in literature. It is usually called a twisted Vera Soro, Vera Soro algebra. So, I want to say uh, in this work, we map the phase space of Weston Mino Winter model in SO2, to phase space of a non relativistic algebra. You can make a lot of analogy between ads 3 cfp 2 and uh, this normal holography. And for example, the topological, you can study topological massive gravity in ADS and it will correspond to this uh, topological massive gravity in this uh, studio Newton hook gravity. And uh, also, isometries uh, can, can be mapped to uh, one another. And uh, the ADS can be considered as a corset construction. In terms of SO, comma two, uh, mm -hmm. quotient is SU two internal symmetries, and the similar thing here is you have two copies of a P two C. The uh, you cannot say this is the most uh, maximum compact subalgebra, but this is uh, algebra you can cross it. You can find this subalgebra from the uh, this P two C cross P two C. You cross it, and you will find this constant construction will give you exactly the bulk of pseudo Newton hook space time and uh, the asymptotic algebra can be also generalized in this case um, but we don't know what the possible set is and uh, these techniques can also be generalized to higher dimensions for example in d dimensions you have 
uh, SOD plus one comma two as uh, isometry of ABS P space time, and uh, you want to add more symmetries uh, contracted with something else, and the contracted symmetry would be SOD comma one plus uh, cross U one, and uh, you contract this algebra with this algebra, then you will get a similar Newton hook of gravity. But there are other generalizations. We are not sure what's the what are physical meaning of this photon BDC black hole, higher spins, or entanglement entropies. And uh, one more discussion I want to add to this is how should I understand this U1? If I want to embed everything into the string theory, might be uh, one of the candidates for this U1 gauge field is the R symmetry currents in some supergravity. You, you think of this R bus as some gauge coupling, uh, some couplings in this uh, gauge field theory, and you can identify the energy as the eigenvalues of this dilatation generator, and you can also identify the, uh, the angular momentum with the U1 charges. And up to some scaling, you can see from the Newton Hook perspective, uh, E is always bigger than, than this J. So this looks like uh, BPS bound for this uh, super conformal uh, uh, field theory. And uh, what we are doing is sending alpha goes to infinity, so equivalently sending this G goes to zero. This from the 4D perspective is the spin matrix theory limit. For example, you can set the Kerfuffle company goes to zero while keeping this E minus J over lambda fixed. So I want to say this is uh, made a claim that the non-relativistic holography is realized in the near BPS uh, limit of some super conformal field theories and super gravities. And uh, you, you should also record it. The example we gave about the Schrodinger gravity is also mysteriously related to some super uh, BMS algebra. And we think this, this holography is simpler because the foliation is, uh, is in the radial direction. So for each foliation surface, you will find, the, uh, let's look at this ABS. Is for each foliation, this is Lorentz invariant. So, which means I have a non-relativistic gravity in the bulk, but I have some CFT, uh, which is relativistic at the boundary. So, which means that this whole graph looks a more simpler version of relative than a relativistic holography because we can use Riemannian geometry to describe the boundary CFT. So at the end, I want to make uh, some discussion about what we have. So we have we give an interpretation of z equals two Lipschitz solution in terms of just, uh, in transcendence theory in terms of the Newton Cartan gravity rather than high spin gravity. But we only it is only successful for z equals to two. So the question might be, in general, there are other dyna dynamic exponents that each of the solutions which you can find in transcendent theory. So can you give an interpretation of what's the meaning of such theories and whether there are any meaning, meaningful Lipschitz holographics? And uh, we also want to say this uh, would be a very nice uh, place to check uh, whether holography can be more general. So, so there are many features to, but many generalizations you can do, for example, what are possible field theory, higher spin, BTZ, or string embeddings, or string theory in this uh, pseudo Newton hook, space time, or possibly everything else you did in ADS3 CFT2. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. I guess it is possible to couple matter to the from cosmic gravity. Yeah. And that kind of matter, I mean, equation of motion, does it look like a Schrodinger equation?
equation or does it look like e squared equal to p to the fourth? I mean, that's the dispersion relation. Is it like e equal to p squared or e squared equal to p to the fourth? E equals to p squared. E equal to p squared. Yeah. Uh, because from the algebra, So, in the relativistic case, this equation is more like uh, this is relativistic energy, this is a rest mass, and R1 mm -hmm. is a C squared. And uh, this L0, which we place the law of the dilatation generator in the in Newton Hook case, is the non relativistic energy. So, you can see this is E equals to uh, M C squared plus something, that's the correct. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank Yang again.